use that as a, our example, no? So if you look at the first three programs of, of NASA, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, we could see that the barometric pressure, this pressure of the environment was very low. So when you lower the, uh, lower the pressure, you have to increase the oxygen to try to, to avoid or, or reduce the chance of hypoxia. And um, uh, so you had 100% oxygen. F uh, in the Skylab uh, missions uh, project in the mid 70s, we, we start using nitrogen as well. So we decrease in, uh, oxygen, increase a bit of nitrogen, but it still was very far away from what we have here on Earth. So it was still, let's say, a very sick type of environment where very healthy people were exposed, but they were suffering. And uh, with the advent of the uh, space um, shuttle in 1981, 12 April 1981 was the first flight, we had this, um, this change in the environment that was possible to have exactly what we have here on Earth, 760 millimeters of mercury, 1 atm, 20% uh, oxygen, 8% nitrogen, temperature controlled, water vapor controlled, uh, except for CO2, that's still much higher than we would like to have in a space station or in spacecraft. Everything was very similar to here on Earth. So what is um, what was, let's say, left for the uh, space scientists, space doctors, physiologists to study and to somehow help astronauts to adapt to this new environment? So let's take these three moments now, uh, this, or these three, the three environments. Orb the Earth's orbit, what is uh, called low Earth orbit missions and these LEO missions, the moon and Mars. So if, if we have the, this atmosphere very similar to what we have here on Earth, we have four main problems that we need to be concerned for the astronauts in space. The effects of microgravity created by free fall, in fact, is not real microgravity. The radiation of space, which is still uh, a bit, let's say, there is still a protection because of the Van Allen uh, uh, rings, you know, that uh, it's the magnetosphere of Earth. And um, we have the, the psychosocial aspects of a space mission, and you have the circadian rhythm that's completely dis dis um, disrupted because uh, at a speed of 27,000 kilometers per hour, uh, and a spacecraft, a space shuttle will, will complete an orbit every 90 minutes, which gives us 16 days uh, in 24 hours, 16 sunsets and 16 sunrise in 24 hours, which is very disruptive for our biology, you know, our, our normal 24 hour cycle. If we go to the moon, then we have um, another, uh, uh, let's say, environment that we also have to adapt to, not just the microgravity of space to get there and the radiation, but we need to uh, deal with this, the aspects of the moon, the characteristics of the moon, basically no atmosphere, so no oxygen, no water, no protection against radiation, meteorites, asteroids, and so on. Lots of moon dust that can affect the well-being and health of astronauts, the habitats, equipment, rovers, and so on. In terms of communication, and this is going to be important for what I'm going to consider later on, which is telehealth, telemedicine, it is uh, the distance is quite good because it's about 300,000 kilometers, uh, which is at the speed of light would give a real-time communication. As it varies a bit, it can have a delay of one to two seconds, which is still okay. And uh, we have the hypogravity there, not microgravity, but hypogravity, because the moon is a, is a smaller in terms of mass than here, uh, than our planet, which gives six times less gravitational force. So someone that's 60 kilos here on Earth will be about 10 kilos on the moon. And if you go to Mars one day, then we are going to deal with another issue, which is the, 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 the atmospheric uh, pre pressure that is very low. But the, 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 main, the main problem is composed by 96% of CO2. It's normal, the normally the temperature is very low, about 60 degrees Celsius uh, negative. And uh, you still have the hypogravity there, which is a bit better than the moon. It's about uh, one third of what he, we have here on Earth. So 60 kilos here, 10 on the moon, 20 on Mars, roughly. And, uh, but the distance is, uh, is major, you know? it's between 55 to 400 million kilometers. And then we are gonna talk of how it can impact the, 
tele, telehealth uh, uh, for astronauts, uh, for people that will be on Mars. And another issue though that con can be affecting the astronauts is that they are gonna see the Earth as a, just a dot in space as we are seeing now Mars from, from Earth. So it is quite a, a challenge. I like to divide the space medicine in three main areas. This is my division. You are not gonna find that in, in textbooks, but I think that it's, it yeah, helps to organize ideas and, uh, and, um, and better understand the challenge that astronauts um, suffer when they are in a space mission. So first, it's going to be the space phys um, physiology, space psychology, which means that it's the, the change that your body and your mind will have if you are uh, exposed to an extraterrestrial environment, if you want or not, you are going to suffer because you are, as I said, in a sick environment. So if you are a health person in a sick environment, it is going to uh, uh, affect you. Uh, operational medicine is the, the medicine related to the logistics of a space mission. So where you are gonna sleep or what you are gonna eat and uh, if you are performing an EVA, which is an extravehicular activity, you are leaving the space station to work outside the vacuum of space. So this is all, uh, there is a logistics that is behind it and it's very important uh, to understand it because it can affect the well-being and the health of astronauts. And then clinical medicine, it's on top of everything is when you, becomes sick in space. So you are sick in a sick environment. So it is, uh, uh, could be any type of um, disease, you no know, respiratory disease, in infections and so on. So another very important aspect when we talk about how to keep someone healthy in space is uh, if we, uh, the mission is going to be a short-term mission or a long-term mission, because the, the, our body systems will react differently to the, uh, to the duration of exposure to the extraterrestrial environment. We are gonna have more, let's say, chains related to the neuro uh, vestibular system and the cardiovascular system. If it's a short-term mission and if it's a long-term mission, you are gonna have issues related to your um, uh, intracranial pressure, for example, or your uh, muscles and bones. So it is, uh, it is completely different the approach that you need to have. And um, uh, very sadly <laughs> to say, uh, we have about 600, let's say, roughly astronauts that um, have been into space, and uh, about 12% only are women. And we know, you know that uh, here on Earth, there are many anatomical, physiological differences between men and women, and also responses to um, uh, some treatment or, or some management like exercise, uh, and also um, the expression of some diseases. So this might, has to be corrected somehow in order to really keep uh, 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 the possibility, let's say, of when they leave, uh, to leave work and uh, uh, reproduce in space. So let's see what we know now very quickly, very just a brief introduction of space physiology. And this is an old chart, but I've, I like it very much because it, it really shows that different body systems, which each one of these uh, lines, uh, it's one body system. Each body system will, will respond um, in a different way to the exposure to microgravity. So some are very quick, like the neurovestibular system, quick response, quick, uh, quick, uh, and quick adapts to, the, to this new environment. Uh, the cardiovascular system, or cardiopulmonary system, takes longer to, to change and a bit longer to adapt. And others, you know, like the, the bones and muscles uh, and the exposure to radiation is a continuous change. So if you look at the yellow line neurovestibular system, you see the, the, that's a very quick response. Cardiovascular system, the red one, is a moderate or medium type of response in terms of time. And then bone, which is um, the uh, dark blue, is continuous change. So this is, is in relation to what I first mentioned between short-term mission and long-term mission. With the mind is the same, you know, we have, um, uh, we have to adapt. Remember that one of the challenges for the missions is the psychosocial aspects of the mission. And then you have isolation, you have monotony, you can, uh, it can lead to depression. Sometimes you feel overloaded. You have this insomnia because this is disruption of your circadian rhythm. You have uh, um, uh, sometimes communication issues. Remember that the crews, the, the space crew nowadays, they are very 
diff, they are very uh, diverse in terms of gender, uh, professional background, uh, language, culture, religion. In the past, we had a more, let's say, homogeneous type of groups that went into space, uh, in general, young men from the military that uh, were selected astronauts. So it's all that affect the, the, the well-being of astronauts in space. Radiation can also affect your cognition, your, uh, your brain function. Uh, so if you are exposed for a long period of time or if you are in deep space uh, going to the moon, to Mars, you might have some effects of radiation in your uh, behavioral and, um, and uh, cognition. Uh, one aspect related to this uh, logistics of uh, uh, space mission, also not related to the physiology and psychology that I just uh, briefly explained, but these, um, uh, let's say, the, the aspects related to our um, um, operational medicine, as I call, it's the, the, let's say, the way that you sleep, for example, is a, good, is, is a very good example because um, uh, the way that you eat, the way, the way that you sleep, the way that you shower, or there is no shower in space, by the way, the way that you clean yourself, your personal hygiene, will affect your well-being and, and your uh, health. So here you can see that uh, you know, to sleep in space might be a challenge because you have people around, you have no privacy sometimes, you, have, uh, uh, you can sleep in different body positions, which is fine uh, physiologically, but emotionally it might affect, affect you. So it is uh, uh, the, 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 it's very clear that these logistics of, uh, of a space mission can affect your well-being. And in space, you know that the quality and the quantity of sleep is reduced. The quality because the rain uh, phase of, of uh, our sleep in space is decreased and the, 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 the quantity because you are supposed to sleep for eight hours and you sleep about six hours per night or, or per uh, space night. So it is, uh, it is very disturbing. Of course, there are countermeasures for that, that are imposed uh, and they are guided sometimes from Earth, but basically uh, the, the, there is this decreasing time of sleep, decreasing quality of sleep that will affect your cognition, your, uh, your performance, your could create some emotional change and you feel tired and so on. And there are several types of uh, um, countermeasures, including uh, pharmacologic interventions, light treatment, psychological support, and so on. And then you go to the third aspect that I mentioned, uh, that is the when you get sick in space. So you are in a sick environment and you are sick. And believe that you become much more common now with space tourism because the selection and training of this, uh, this space tourists will be much lower no, uh, than we, we have nowadays in terms of astronaut selection. So sick people will go in, uh, probably will fly. Uh, they will be taking medication. So this aspect of clinical medicine in space will be much more, let's say, important somehow um, uh, th than it is uh, right now. And if you look at this table, no, it's 17 years of a space shuttle uh, program. You can see that astronauts uh, suffered different types uh, of, let's say, medical conditions. Uh, infectious diseases, uh, problems related to trauma, skin and um, digestive problems, and so on. So it is uh, something that is happening, you know, and uh, psychologically as well. This is another chart uh, from uh, another table from um, uh, astronauts that flew at NASA, at Mir space station, and depression was uh, uh, one of these uh, issues, let's say. Of course, you have countermeasures. You can use exercise, different types of exercise to improve the cardiovascular system, the bones and muscles. So there are ways for to counteract some of these, uh, let's say, effects of microgravity. We can also use that uh, um, uh, uh, countermeasures for the mind. So socialization, playing music, playing games, uh, may maybe it, we, even with friends and the relatives that are on Earth. Uh, there are some publications you now from uh, scientists, space scientists that promote the idea of yoga, mindfulness, meditation. And now that India is going to send their first Vyomanauts into space, I believe that it will be, it will be boosted, you know, this type of uh, countermeasures for psychosocial problems. And of course, also as countermeasures, although not very well studied uh, till now, 
is the use of medication, so space pharmacy. Uh, and I say that because you basically use what we have here on Earth in space in terms of those and those intervals, which is uh, wrong in my opinion, as we know that the, there is a change in our physiology, in our anatomy even, uh, and it might not function in the same way, you know, the medication. So what is needed? We know that, uh, as I mentioned, the, there is the space physiology and psychology that happens if you are in space, uh, the operational medicine because of the logistics of a space mission and, uh, and the clinical situations that can happen when you are in space. So you know that from a cell to any, or any big uh, system in our body, everything is affected by this extraterrestrial environment. So you need to train astronauts to identify first what is really normal change, let's say, or expected change that they will suffer in a, in, a, in, a, in a space mission. And when this is a bit, a bit more than just a change that you are really uh, not um, just suffering with the exposure to microgravity, let's say, but you are really sick. And then you have to perform some medical procedures, maybe you know, in, in, in case of an accident, you know, if, you, uh, have a, if you cut yourself or <laughs> in the mission for some reason, and to collect data to send to Earth. You now that's when telemedicine or telehealth starts. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, everybody understands that telemedicine the, did not start with the space, um, uh, human space exploration. Although there was a very interesting co coincidence that uh, Eindhoven in 1906 transmitted the first uh, exam, the first medical exam was transmitted by the inventor of the ECG, so it was a tele-ECG, and Gagarin basically 60 years later had its first ECG, uh, uh, had his ECG transmitted to Earth, which was also the first medical exam transmitted from uh, space, so here on Earth and from space to Earth was the same uh, uh, medical exam. So you have to send it to Earth, uh, somehow someone has to get it, and try to understand and try to help the astronauts. Uh, could be in terms of their, uh, even their adaptation to microgravity, they can, they can suffer a lot sometimes with the neurovestibular systems, having space motion sickness, vomiting a lot. You need to be guided of what to do, but in case of um, uh, a clinical situation as well. If you are in the that first, um, uh, uh, type of mission that I mentioned, the LEO uh, type of mission, low Earth orbit mission, then it is, it is a piece of cake because you have a communication system that works very well at the speed of light, real-time communication between astronauts and space scientists and doctors, no problem to collect medical data, to give support during medical emergencies, and even to guide you know, the crew members in terms of their physiological and psychological changes that are expected in a space mission. Uh, there was, this is a good uh, example, in 2019, there was this uh, clot in one of the jugular veins of an astronaut, and it was treated via telemedicine, and I think that it's very, a very good example to show that in a clinical situation, an emergent situation, it was uh, then managed by doctors here on Earth. In 2017, this is a publication from the European Space Agency, it was the telemedicine was added not just during the space missions, but after landing. So the astronauts, when they were uh, coming outside of the space uh, uh, spacecraft, they were already uh, plugged in te telemedicine uh, devices and, um, and the softwares and so on to transmit the data, the physiological data to doctors in, um, in the mission control center. I thought, remember that I mentioned that the, for the moon, it would be more or less the same type of communication as we have now uh, with the LEO missions because it is going to be more basically real time communication with a delay of one to two seconds max. But uh, if you go to Mars, it's a completely different scenario as I mentioned before, it is 55 to 400 million kilometers, which gives a delay of communication between three minutes each way to 22 minutes each way depend on the distance between the two planets. So this will create a huge problem. And you need, of course, the astronaut training. You need to produce some uh, tools in space using the 3D uh, printer, you no know, medical tools and uh, uh, the odontological tools as well. 
but you are not going to be able to be guided by the, by earth especially in an emergent situation in some clinical scenarios in some um, uh, aspects related to adaptation to mars or to microgravity during the trip we can still use our offline communication and have this um, you know you store and forward communication you store somewhere for the information and then uh, you get the reply later on but in case of a clinical a more severe clinical case or in an emergency then you need the support of uh, a artificial intelligence and uh, i believe so this is a, where robonauts, robo, robots as doctors will play an important role to uh, help astronauts to identify these um, medical issues and uh, to start managing them or guide how to manage them uh, in, a, in an emergency scenario. But remember, it's not just the transmission, it's not just the communication between Mars and, and, and Earth. We are gonna, we are gonna need um, a very important constellation of satellites on Mars, you no, know, or on the Moon, uh, around the Mars, around the Moon, to um, to have a better uh, to use the satellites in favor of the or of, of uh, health of this uh, cruise, uh, the cruise in uh, in um, uh, on these uh, places, but also to uh, guarantee that there is a good connectivity. So that's very important. So these constellations that you are talking now here on Earth uh, with um, different companies, no, it is very, uh, it will be very important also on Mars and one day uh, also on the Moon. So we are going to, they, they need to be autonomous somehow. Uh, the astronauts on, this, on, on Mars must be as autonomous as possible. And so the interconnectivity between satellites and mission controls and and uh, and rovers and uh, and habitats will be very important. But remember, no, this is not it's not all flowers. No, it is uh, satellites. They they are orbiting the, the the Earth nowadays, and when they will orbit Mars and then the Moon, I believe. But it is causing a problem. No, it is there is uh, the space debris, the space junk that could affect also uh, the well-being of uh, astronauts when they are exposed to uh, in, in the orbit of these places or uh, even uh, falling down and causing damage to habitats uh, and, uh, and, and people. So it is quite interesting that um, in 2021, the United States uh, uh, Space Surveillance Network identified 15 uh, 15,000 pieces of space debris larger than 10 centimeters and 200,000 between one and 10 centimeters. So this space junk, which is basically no essential, no functional objects in Earth's orbit, could be old satellites, satellites that were, you know, that collided and then parts of the pieces of that are just orbiting the Earth, space tools, old rockets, also pieces of old rockets, it is, it is an enormous amount of, of garbage there. So we need to remember that if you're just going to export the idea of having constellations of satellites around the moon and, and around Mars to um, somehow uh, improve transmission and, uh, of data and also improve con connectivity uh, in, the, uh, in these places. Um, so here is just a, an example you know, of a collision uh, so that's the space shut shuttle uh, endeavor in 2007. It's a big hole, no? <laughs> and of course, if you are outside the AVA, AVA activities, you can be hit by something. It, it will function as a bullet, you no? Know? And during moon exploration, moon uh, Mars habitats also can be affected by by this type of uh, of uh, debris, no? In terms of uh, uh, what we, what we expect to have in these missions, in long-term missions, missions for space tourists, as I mentioned, sick people in a sick environment or health people in a sick environment. What is important to understand is that the environment will always be sick, sick in inverted commas, or it will be different from what we are used to, and uh, that our body and our mind are used to. So we are gonna be needing digital technology to help us. So studies with virtual reality, uh, uh, augmented reality, um, explained uh, in, um, artificial intelligence uh, systems, metaverse, everything that can help either by 
training people by uh, helping them to uh, improve their skills in, in terms of how to manage, identify and manage diseases will be very important. We are, I'm very happy that I'm starting studies uh, linking space physiology, microgravity simulations, uh, hypogravity simulations, and uh, digital technology, including VR and metaverse. So just to finalize them, it is very important to, to keep this um, connection between uh, the earth and, um, and the space. So you have to uh, promote as much as possible the technology transfer of, um, uh, the, the, not just technology, but I mean knowledge, products, methods, techniques, process that you can transfer between earth and space and space to earth. It is um, it's mandatory, you know, that it that is under that it is uh, promoted somehow, because we know that some stuff will be produced to space for space mission and we stay in space. Um, of course, many things we produce here on Earth stays here on Earth, but we need this communication. It's much more robust from Earth to space, but sometimes we are going to need from space uh, to Earth to. Uh, improve our, our um, health and medicine uh, care here uh, in our planet. So it is not something new, of course, what I'm, what I'm saying now, it is um, going on for many, many decades. So NASA has this spin-off um, site where you can uh, see that many different areas are uh, contemplated. Uh, it is going on for more than 40 years and health and medicine is one of them. And uh, of course, telemedicine and e-health is very important because whatever we learn of how to treat astronauts in space missions, you can use here on Earth for remote areas, for um, um, devastated areas because of a natural disaster or war. There are many applications, of course, of telemedicine and e-health here on Earth. And we, we can learn, of course, with what we, uh, we, with the health and well-being of astronauts in space, we can learn techniques, we can learn more about the, the science itself in terms of our cells and our body systems. We can develop new equipment and device to be applied in space that can be used here on Earth. And again, the digital technology that I already mentioned that will help to investigate diseases and improve treatment. We have countermeasures that I mentioned very briefly, but exercise, sleep countermeasures that you can use uh, social, um, uh, emotional countermeasures, and it can be applied here on Earth. Uh, we there was this parallel the, during the COVID nineteen, the the lockdowns where we were like astronauts, completely uh, let's say uh, locked in without references, changing our routine, and some of the knowledge that some of the knowledge that we develop in space for the adaptation of astronauts to this new environment in terms of uh, uh, psychosocial uh, and emotional behaviors was uh, uh, basically uh, in, um, exported or, or imported here on Earth for our uh, lockdowns and so on. Aging, genetics, robo robots that can be doctors, all that will uh, are, are aspects related to space emissions that can be, of course, used here. So this is my contribution for the panel. I hope you have enjoyed. I will stop sharing. I hope I have not used much more than I supposed to because I, I feel always very guilt when I do that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It's a fascinating topic. And uh, thank you for sharing your vast experience in this, in this theme. And uh, now I would like to, to invite our colleague, Charles, Professor Charles Dolan. Please, Professor, welcome. No microphone. You're on mute. See, that's, that's one of the lessons in telemedicine is the technology always, either we don't know how to use it or we forget. Um, I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning and this afternoon uh, about uh, space exploration and remote, mon uh, remote monitoring, remote medicine, uh, specifically telemedicine. Uh, I personally uh, have been in this uh, space for uh, over 30 years. Uh, this slide here tells you a little bit about me. Uh, and these are what I'm gonna say this morning is, or this afternoon is all based on my own 
personal opinion uh, as a professor at a university. I'm also on detail to NASA. I work for Dr. Polk, who's the chief medical officer. And over the last number of years, so I've produced a couple of things I think that are relevant. One uh, is this, um, this textbook on space physiology and medicine. Uh, this is written with Dr. Nikogosian, uh, Dr. Williams, uh, Carolyn Huntoon, myself, Dr. Polk, and Victor Schneider. Many of you may know of these people uh, if you've worked at NASA, with NASA in some regard. The second one is this book here. It's called uh, Engineering Life Sciences and Health and Medicine Synergy. And this, uh, if you can see in the picture uh, where the astronaut is in the middle of those three Venn diagrams. The reason why I bring that up is one of the challenges in develop, delivering healthcare in space is that most of the people who work at NASA, Roscosmos, uh, Indian Space Research uh, Organization, uh, ESA, uh, CSA Canada, uh, JAXA, and so on, are more engineers than they are physicians. And there are a lot of life scientists as well. And those three individuals or those three disciplines are never on the same page. And when they're not on the same page, uh, bad things happen. And we'll talk about some of that. Uh, one of the other things, uh, I am also the editor of this journal, Telemus and Yale Journal. Some of you have reviewed, some of you have seen it. And one of the other things I'm working on with NASA is this MISAP manual. This MISAP manual uh, discusses how do we address uh, MISAP, whether it's something like the Challenger or the Columbia accidents, or it, uh, God forbid something happens uh, in the future on a, on a future space exploration. Uh, and another one is this book uh, with NATO on telemedicine disaster response. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, the newest textbook on telemedicine and telehealth is this one here with Dr. Latifi and Dr. Ron Merrill. Uh, many of you may know them. So those, uh, that's sort of the background slide. What I wanted to talk about is the very early use of telemetry in mammals on space flight or in space flight. Uh, Sputnik 2, which was the second satellite launched into space by the Soviet Union in, 1990, in 1957. Excuse me. And on that flight, there was a dog named Laika. And in the, do the dog, you can see in the picture, uh, was to be monitored uh, for a period of days, uh, perhaps approaching maybe a week, week and a half. Uh, the, the, uh, the dog did not survive the mission, but we were able to download a lot of information the space community, specifically the Soviet Union, was able to download a lot of information about this uh, animal uh, and the conditions in which she was living. Uh, they followed that with the second uh, dog going into space that was Belka. If you've ever been to the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow, you can see Belka is in a box in Dr. Gazenko's office. Uh, it's uh, interesting to look at, but also a little creepy. Uh, but nevertheless, those lessons we learned actually helped us understand how do we monitor astronauts in low Earth orbit and on planetary bodies? Uh, the technology developed in the late 1950s, EKG sensors uh, and so forth were developed uh, here in Ohio at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base uh, by our um, pioneers in this field, uh, Dr. Stan White uh, and some of the other people from the Space Task Group in the late 50s. As we begin to ramp up crew monitoring, and trying to figure out whether human beings could actually survive in space. This is something uh, that many of the uh, German scientists at the end of World War II were interested in. The obviously the bioastronautics uh, development here in the United States in the uh, Air Force in the 50s tried to understand what would happen to a human being in low Earth orbit. Could we actually do the various bodily functions, eat, go to the bathroom, survive and so forth. Uh, we, we understand now that we were able to download uh, information from as far away as the moon in near real time. There is some, some delay, but we were able to monitor those individuals at Mission Control uh, in Houston. But I also want to talk a little bit about some of the other activities that NASA was involved in. In the 1960s, uh, the Applied Technology Satellite, ATS-1, was the first uh, satellite used uh, in Alaska for uh, any Canadian Indian Health Service to monitor individuals that were at distance site. So this is applying, uh, as Dr. Osmano pointed out, the technology coming out of the space program actually applying it in real, uh, in real time on terrestrial benefits. The ATS-3 satellite uh, was then used, and then of course the uh, ATA 
uh, ATS, excuse me, six was used in the Mexico earthquake in 1985. And that actually provided opportunities for uh, medical professionals to address unmet needs in the aftermath of a disaster. And that becomes very important is ground-based test beds to allow us to uh, understand and evaluate technology that we may want to fly in space. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And here are four uh, nice uh, citations that you can use that talk about some of these things in the past. As the Apollo program was coming to an end, uh, this goes back to the Kennedy uh, Johnson Nixon administrations in the 1960s and the push to, um, to win the space race. Very early on in the 1960s, both President King and Nikita Khrushchev actually met to talk about a joint mission to the moon. Uh, this was in early 61, 62 time period. And when, when Kennedy was assassinated and Johnson became president, he uh, was not, he didn't, he didn't believe that we should be using or working with the Soviets uh, in this particular area. So that, that project was abandoned. Obviously we went ahead and landed on the moon in the, in the late sixties and fulfilled the Kennedy dream of getting to the moon and before the end of the decade. But be, be, during that time period, there was a the development of a, a, a space plane, the space shuttle program, but there was also this concept of developing a space station. And one of the things that uh, in preparation for that was this uh, program called Integrated Medical and Behavioral Laboratory Measurement System, which was fundamentally a telemedicine link uh, in uh, Arizona. You can see in the lower left-hand corner, a picture of the uh, uh, Sonora Desert in uh, down near the Mexican border between Arizona and, and, and uh, Mexico. And the development of this uh, system provided a link between the Indian reservation and the people on the reservation uh, to uh, healthcare facilities in Sells, Arizona. And this was a big push by the Nixon administration to actually utilize the enormous amount of money that was being spent in space exploration to benefit people on Earth. And I remember seeing a, uh, excuse me, a movie uh, called First Man. This is a movie, a Hollywood sensational movie about Neil Armstrong. And in the, excuse me, in the movie, they show uh, the rocket being launched and they show a lot of African-Americans talking uh, on, the, they were sort of watching from the Banana River, talking about, um, you know, they needed to be fed while Whitey was going to the moon. <clears throat> the point being here was that in the 60s, and even today, we see this in the United States, you all have seen the news uh, of the terrible tragedies that we seem to face almost on a daily basis now. Um, is that one group of people are, are somehow disenfranchised by the technology uh, that's being pushed out by the federal efforts. And this has been ongoing for a number of decades. The Nixon administration really wanted to change that by integrating these technologies uh, in a way which everyone could benefit. So this was field tested. You can see in the upper right hand corner, a, a, a nurse practitioner uh, with a patient and the patient's mother uh, in a mobile van I'll show you a photograph of that in a minute. This was in the field unit and was deployed uh, to look at uh, how this technology might be used remotely and then how that same system could be used on Skylab and future shuttle missions, again, beginning to develop the technologies and the requirements for that mission. So many different organizations were involved. Boeing, obviously, we all know Boeing. The Papago Indians, were, which are now called the Daona Odom tribe, and they actually had a lot of politics involved. You can see in the upper or lower uh, right-hand corner, the map uh, of the uh, border of the United States and, and Mexico. And this was where the uh, Indian reservation was. This a unit here was the unit that was actually deployed. And it was a motor home, uh, sort of a camper on wheels that was outfitted with the equipment you see on the right. Now in conversations a number of years ago with Sam Poole, uh, who has since passed away, he told me they actually developed uh, new recording devices uh, to allow them to record data. These were optical drives. They did not exist uh, before this, this project. They also did not really have a lot of faith in monitoring uh, remotely from long distances. It was one thing when you have an extremely uh, complex downlink system between uh, the space uh, platform, whether it's a space station or a shuttle or or uh, even some of the commercial providers, they downlink information to White Sands, uh, and then it's transmitted through a global network. Uh, now, of course, between uh, Russia, the U European Space Agency, and Cologne, 
uh, Canada and, and JAXA in Japan. Uh, so to understand what's going on on the actual space station. Now, in the late 60s, after the Gemini mission, uh, Dr. Charles Berry was in a meeting in uh, uh, Prague, Czechoslovakia, and he was asked to come to a meeting. Uh, well, he, he talked about the results of this of the Gemini missions, the 14-day mission, and the Soviet scientists were, were amazed that he was so open. As you remember, the United States space program is on the front page. It's on the news. It's not hidden away as the Soviet program was in the 1960s and 70s. And so they asked him if he would come to a meeting and, uh, and imagine uh, going to the uh, basement of a castle. Uh, and he approaches this room, which is very noisy on the inside. And as they opened the door, the noise and the cigarette smoke came out of the room and they were all had been drinking vodka. And they said, Dr. Berry, we want you to come to Moscow and teach us about space medicine. Uh, and of course he approached the Nixon administration about this and Nixon administration was not interested at all in this until uh, Nixon came back from China and they began to develop what's now called the joint working group between the US and USSR, or US slash Russia joint working group on biology and medicine. They decided to have a joint uh, docking mission and these two, diff two different spacecraft had never docked before. So they had different atmospheres, but at the end of that mission, there was a nitrogen tetroxide uh, exposure, which caused chemical pneumonitis. And this is where operational telemedicine came into play. Uh, as you know, or many of you know, Dr. Nikogosian was one of the flight surgeons, uh, uh, crew surgeons on that mission, and was able to get the crew to um, Tripler, our Army Medical Center in uh, Hawaii. So this really formed the foundation of international collaboration in space medicine. There were a number of subgroups uh, on this. One of them was on telemedicine. And when I joined NASA in 1990, uh, I was uh, on that team. And that allowed us then to develop um, some technology and project programs, if you will, on developing telemedicine uh, in the space program. Here are two citations. Uh, the summary of the first one that I wrote with uh, some of our Russian colleagues was basically on summer, summarizing the activities of the joint working group, which had not been uh, summarized in any kind of manuscript. There are obviously a number of publications, a large books, a collection of books. Uh, there were uh, three different collections over the last uh, 50 years that talk about our joint collaborations. Now the Space Bridge to Armenia, UFA, Russia, was the very uh, first large scale telemedicine uh, used in a disaster. Uh, and the point here, and again, not to specifically talk about the, the, the outcome of the re, uh, program or the results, but it's to, to demonstrate the fact that it was a joint US-USSR mission, and it showed that an existing telemedicine system could be easily adapted to a disaster. And this happened when there was uh, a train wreck in Ufa, Russia, and the telemedicine network was immediately uh, used to receive those patients, many of them children, at burn uh, centers in Houston, Texas via telemedicine. The Space Bridge to Moscow uh, was a follow-on to that program, and it was using a dedicated uh, broadband um, satellite communication, and it was bi-directional. The first one in Space Bridge Armenia was uh, one-directional, and they used a fax machine for a number of different uh, dialogue going back and forth. And the, this the Space Bridge to Moscow used dedicated assets. Now, the existing telemedicine, as I said, was used to, from Armenia to Ufa, but then the Space Bridge to Moscow was actually used during the civil strife. If you remember uh, when the Soviet Union broke up and the Commonwealth of Independent States was created and um, there was a number of, of battles being fought in the bill, you see the building here is the uh, part of the Russian uh, government uh, the, uh, in Moscow. They actually had asked us to utilize our telemedicine link in the aftermath of this. Basically, uh, tanks were opening fire on this building. Uh, that provided a, a lot of unique opportunities for us to utilize an existing telemedicine system. My point being, if an existing telemedicine system is already there and in place, can be easily adapted to provide response to disasters. And I'll talk a little bit more, more about our multinational system uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, and we actually tried to get this up and running a couple of months ago uh, at the very beginning of the uh, Russian invasion. 
One of the other things we created was a commercial space center uh, at, at Yale, and then it moved from Yale University to Virginia Commonwealth University, and that was under the direction of Ron Merrill and myself. And then we have the use of telemedicine to look at the Chilean miners, Dr. Polk, uh, J.D. Polk, and others were involved in that during the uh, Obama administration. Now, if you go back to 1994, we developed this concept of using the internet uh, and the World Wide Web. And you can see in this inset picture, which is telecollaboration online database, those icons would then lead you to a particular website or particular link to the website. that would allow us to do a number of different things, including develop an EMR. We could multicast this. And I presented this at a meeting in 1994, and I was told this is never gonna work Nobody's going to use the World Wide Web. The internet is a passing fancy, and therefore, uh, you guys are crazy. And I can tell you that in the right panel, there's a picture of me, much younger me, and uh, another person at one of the NASA centers in the Cleveland, Ohio, talking about this individual's broken leg, the Ilazarov method, which is a two um, DNA looking structure to the left of the person's leg. And you can see clearly image. Uh, capture and uh, all manner of things. This this basically was the foundation of, of web-based telemedicine uh, and also used a lot of store and forward. Uh, the multicasting backbone allowed you to multicast. So just like we're doing today, I'm here in Cincinnati and I'm talking with you, uh, individuals that are perhaps all over the, the world. And many of these papers have been written. Uh, many of you may know Dr. Sarkissian, uh, was involved in Armenia earthquake. He's actually at the Johnson Space Center now as an ultrasonographer. David Newman, the second author in the first paper, was the deputy administrator of NASA uh, with Charlie Bolden and a couple of other people uh, on the bottom, Dr. Michael DeBakey, uh, of course, uh, a famous cardiothoracic surgeon. So then in, uh, in the mid-1980s, uh, 1990, excuse me, we developed the telemedicine implementation plaque, pack, which was flown on the space shuttle uh, on SCS-89. It was evaluated, and then Stephen Wiley, who created a company uh, after Krug Life Sciences, they, they closed down and became Wiley, and now it's called KBR. They actually bought that, the rights to that, and he was going to manufacture this. Now, we had talked about doing this at our commercial space center, but everybody said no one's ever going to buy these remote packs. Now, when you go to the American Telemedicine Association, which I just returned from in Boston or the ISATE H meetings in the past, you might have vendors showing these very same kinds of packs. So we were probably 10 years ahead of, of everybody else when we were thinking about those kinds of things. From a political perspective, the Space Station of Freedom was something that uh, President Reagan had, had, well, he didn't come up with the idea, but he wanted the, the US to build a space station. Uh, we began to developing that. It was supposed to be $8 billion. It turned out to be more like 150 to 200 million billion dollars. And President Clinton wanted to uh, in, encourage the Russian, the, now that the Soviet Union was broken up, the Russians to participate. And for the last nearly 30 years, we worked very closely with, with our counterparts all over the world on flying people to the space station. Uh, one of the um, elements of that was to fly cosmonaut to do life sciences work. Uh, and to uh, incorporate telemedicine. Those were the three tenets of foreign policy by the Clinton administration to get the Russians involved and so the Russians wouldn't sell the rocket technology to India. And that project was $450 million that provided funding to, directly to the Russian government to ha have them become part of the space station project, which now is called the International Space Station. So because of that work in the joint working group and our work in the, the Apollo Soyuz test project, we were actually able to develop the multilateral medical operations working group in the lower right hand corner. You can see Mike Barrett, one of our astronauts standing up, or you can see Roger Billica in the foreground. Uh, you can see me right behind um, and Dr. Uh, uh, some of our Japanese counterparts and some other of our Russian uh, counterparts. So you can see uh, uh, Volker Dahman and some others as well. Now these, this basically allowed us to develop the foundation of what we are doing today. Now, during the Clinton administration, Vice President Cor Gore met with Victor Chernomirdin, and they, they established the concept of developing a 
English Western style, English speaking Western style medical center in Moscow State University. And they developed the East West Space Science Center, which allowed former Soviet or Eastern Bloc countries to come to the United States and learn how to do peer reviewed science, of which telemedicine was one of them. So in about the 1996 time period, I was given the task to write NASA's strategic plan for telemedicine, which you can see a copy of it here. And many of the people, many of the events I've already talked about are listed here. Uh, Rogue Zagdaev used to be in charge of the ICI, which was the Space Research Institute. Uh, he was married to Susan Eisenhower of the President Eisenhower's daughter, and that provided opportunity for, for the, that East-West Space Science to be developed at the University of Maryland. The Space Biomedical Center then was created uh, in, in Moscow, at Moscow State, and uh, Dr. Grigoriev and Dr. Orlov uh, were both part of that. Dr. Orlov, uh, obviously, is the director of the Institute of Biomedical Problems, continues to this day to focus on the Space Biomedical Center. And the other one was creating a commercial space center. The commercial space center, uh, as you can see the emblem of that in the right side, along with uh, a photograph of Moscow State University. Now the concept was to, to develop a, a number of a test bed projects. You can see in this picture, we did a lot of stuff on Mount Everest. Uh, we did uh, projects NEMO, NEMO, this happens to be NEMO 12. I was the PI of that mission. And we did a lot of robotic telesurgery from the habitat, which is in the lower left picture with the fish, uh, astronauts and uh, other visitors stay in that habitat for long periods of time. And you can't just go down there, spend you know, a day and surface, you have to go through the pre-breathe protocol so as to not get the bends. And we were able to demonstrate a number of different activities and that actually led to a number of peer reviewed publications, uh, which you can certainly find online. From a federal perspective, there was a health information applications working group began in 1995. NASA was the lead for the National Capital Area Testbed, um, but we didn't have uh, the, the bandwidth or the wherewithal, or certainly not the money that the DOD had. And so a lot of programs uh, began to be funded by DOD such that they had upwards of half a billion dollars in money to support uh, through what they call earmarks uh, during the uh, Bush administration, Obama administration, Bush administration, and Trump administration, those all sort of went away and, and Tatrick itself is nowhere near the size it, as it was. But we also held a number of, of international conferences on telemedicine and the FedTel effort to this today, I serve as co-chair uh, of that group. Uh, so human spaceflight, I think uh, Dr. Rosamano kind of highlighted some of the needs, the capabilities, the challenges. Uh, you can see being in space, uh, low Earth orbit is, is not as, as challenging as being on the moon and it's certainly not the challenge that's gonna be on the way to Mars. Uh, you can look out and see the earth, you can see you know, uh, a number of, of sunrises and sunsets every day. You're traveling an enormous speed of 25,000 miles or more an hour. Uh, you're looking down and seeing uh, the beauty of, of our planet and, and you're not really concerned, well, you're concerned, but you don't, see the challenges that we see on earth that, that we're all aware of, whether it's global warming, um, war, terrorism, and so forth. But the opportunities to provide us uh, will, will help us then lead to other new discoveries. And so here we have adaptation advances in telemedicine and long duration spaceflight. Uh, you can see the authors there uh, that have written this and we talk about proximity ops. If you're on a spacecraft from going between here and low Earth orbit, there is real-time communication. <clears throat> when you're on the moon, there's a slight delay. And when you're in deep space, there's either a long delay, uh, as Dr. Rosamano pointed out, it's a 22 minute delay when you're on the surface of Mars. So if you step out and you grab your chest and you say, Houston, I have a problem. 22 minutes later, they're gonna say, what kind of problem is it? And you see you're already 44 or 45 minutes into a mishap. And so you're gonna have to have the technology and the capability to, to provide healthcare on the earth. Uh, it, it doesn't mean telemedicine can't be used, but it will be in a stored forward, uh, not real time mode. So when you look at current ops, you know, the CMO is right there in constant communication with ground personnel. And so the, at the Johnson Space Center, there's mission control. They may very well have people working with uh, you know, they may not have a, an ophthalmologist on console, but they have a link to a, uh, a person. They might have a toxicologist person 
on standby. They might have uh, an exercise countermeasures person on the standby. And so there's a dialogue that goes back and forth in real time. Or the information can be uploaded uh, and sent uh, on an exploration mission if you're going on to, to Mars. Now here, here we've seen robots, we've seen AI. Uh, there are, are technologies now that allow you to, in Japan actually, to actually go and have a relationship with a robot. Uh, I just, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but the technology is rapidly changing and if we all would have sat down 20, 25 years ago and said in the year 2021 and 2022, we would send uh, tens of 20 people into space on commercial spacecraft, we might have said that's not possible. But we've seen that in the last 18 months with both SpaceX and Virgin Galactic uh, and Blue Origin all sending uh, paying customers up into space. Uh, it, it right now may be considered a billionaire's club uh, where where those individuals have a, a lot of money, but in the very uh, short foreseeable future, it'll be the average person. It'll still be expensive, but it'll be much like uh, aviation was in the 1930s. So the, there are highly detailed requirements. Uh, you live uh, live remote guidance, live monitoring. That's all right here where we are, but when you go out to store and forward, uh, you can become uh, somewhat autonomous. And you can see uh, from the surface of Mars, you can see that's what the earth looks like. So that has an impact on you as an individual uh, from, from the standpoint of your psychosocial perspective. You look out, you can see the earth, you can see the moon, or you can see the earth from the moon. And there's some sense of, A, there is a possibility that I can be in contact with an expert. Uh, there is a possibility that I could be rescued. Fundamentally, not probably not a reality, but it's if you're on Mars, there is literally, you're there. there there's no way for you to communicate uh, in real time. It's always gonna be in a store and forward mode. That means you have to have the supplies. And, and it's not just about exploration and, and, and going there and exploring and coming home. At some point, we're gonna live there permanently as human beings, not necessarily in the next 30 or 40 years, but it's very possible that you could have a human settlement on, on both the moon, and on Mars. And the question then comes up is, do we have the same kind of construct that we have in the Antarctic, where we where people winter over at McMurdo uh, or uh, the Nari station that the Australians have, where the Russians are stationed, the Russians uh, run. Uh, with, with the same challenges that we see there, we might, have, we might see similarities. And so it's a great opportunity for test beds to be able to do that. So here you can see in current ops, we, we rely on the ground uh, for exploration, you have to have remote uh, oversight. So you might very well have a smart, intelligent system that helps you make decisions on how to get things done. Store and forward is underutilized. We'll increase the use of store and forward, obviously. Uh, the data uplink is pretty good here. The data downlink uh, from uh, an exploration mission will have to increase. And there are many ways of thinking about doing that. Uh, we have uh, better instrumentation. Uh, we have a larger footprint in the in low Earth orbit because we're right here. Uh, we're in close proximity, but on the space uh, flight to uh, Mars, it would become much more complicated. And so one of the things uh, I actually have had the opportunity of doing, I've, I've been able to write five of, I think there's seven specific reports on surgery in extreme environments. And I've been involved in writing five of those reports over the last 30, 32 or 33 years. And I remember someone telling me once, well, we're not really gonna ever do surgery in space. And I, I said, well, I actually, I believe that we're actually going to do surgery in space. And the reason being is because at some point we're gonna be living on another planet and you're gonna to have to have the capability. Now it might be robotically driven or an AI system, uh, but it's certainly gonna be uh, able to be done. And so the quest, question is, is, what are the requirements then of the astronaut or the cosmonaut of the person who's flying in space. Uh, they're obviously trained for many years. Uh, space flight participants or people maybe have trained for six weeks and go up and come down. Uh, I know the FAA is responsible for calling them uh, astronauts or flight participants. It's not a NASA uh, decision at this point. And so you have the requirements. I mean, should we, should we send a trauma surgeon? Uh, what about an OBGYN? What about a uh, an internist. I mean, what is the qualification of the flight, uh, space flight 
physician, is he or she actually a board certified physician trained? We also look at Technology Watch, uh, commercial developments, information management, artificial intelligence, new ways of thinking. I mean, if I remember I was in a meeting in, in the 1995 or so, and I had a PDA and a cell phone. And I asked the guy, so why can't I put these two, two together? And instead of pulling the antenna out of the top of the phone, it could be embedded in the phone. And I was told it's not possible. And so today you can pull out your iPhone or your Android, but whoever manufactures your Android, we know who uh, WC the uh, iPhone, and you can actually pull up PowerPoint. You can pull up Excel spreadsheets. You can look at PDF documents. You can make reservations at restaurants in, in London from Ohio. Uh, you can make. Uh, uh, you can be in the middle of. Uh, we were at a NATO meeting. We were in the middle of uh, Brussels, and somebody pulled out their phone and ordered an Uber, and got us to where we needed to be. So these things are all part of you know space exploration. Yes, some of it comes from military. Uh, work as well, but a lot of these things we see today are a direct result of, of our spaceflight uh, opportunities. This is from a, a safe passage document that was written uh, for NASA. Uh, the human being must be integrated to the space mission in the same way in which all other aspects of the mission are integrated. And a lot of times uh, the, the, the human in the system is often not forgotten, but not central to that. And that's, that's the purpose of this, this book I mentioned here, where uh, if you're not, if you don't get those people involved, then the bad things can happen. So future applications, then, uh, as I close out, autonomous care, care, to me, uh, printing organisms, uh, printing organs, and scaffolding. Uh, on, and as you see in the in the cartoon, uh, I'm not sure the system will look quite that uh, disgusting, but nevertheless, it is possible today to grow your own organs. Uh, we use artificial intelligence. And the, the smart systems, they need to be wherever the patient is. And I think that the center pi picture of Matt Damon, the shirtless Matt Damon, on the movie, The Martian, was really somewhat believable with all the advanced technology and so forth until he pours out on the table a bunch of old surgical instruments. I thought that was kind of interesting, but you know, he's gonna, the crews are gonna have to be able to take care of whatever problem they experience. And the up, uh, second picture is uh, from the movie, Star Wars, where you have uh, the, the robot, help, robot helping the delivery of, of the babies. Uh, and then the last slide then you, uh, this is just from uh, Winston Churchill, to improve is to change and to be perfect is to change often. And I think a lot of times it took a long time for people to understand the value and the utility of telemedicine until the pandemic hit us in the back of the head with a two by four. And now we understand that we actually can do things that people thought were impossible. There are some reference materials. Uh, here you can see uh, some of the things I've already talked about. Uh, and I will close with um, that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Charles Dobon, for this brilliant presentation. I learned it a lot. Thank you very much. And uh, before inviting our next speaker, I'd like to remember our attendees that uh, after our presentation, we will have some discussion. So please, your comments and questions are very welcome in the chat. So uh, now I have the pleasure to, to invite Professor Dina Ziadlu. So please welcome Professor. Hello everyone. Thank you so much. Really appreciate for your invitation and thank you, Dr. Charles, Dr. Tice, for your informative uh, and insightful presentations. I learned a lot. So uh, let me start my wrap up presentation while you guys are uh, kind of covering all the information and the important points that we have in space exploration. So I just continue to wrap up this session with some uh, important points. Let me, okay. So just, uh, I would like to start my presentation with one of, uh, one of my favorite quotes by uh, astronaut Neil Armstrong. Uh, that's one small step for man one giant leap for mankind. 
so we talk about the feeling that the astronauts had in um, walking on air, on air, life without gravity. And as you know, uh, we learned that we have two groups of people astronauts from a space agency and on the other hand the race of uh, space tourism these days with the uh, those who, uh, who ambition for signing up for commercial trips are uh, going to be two uh, huge opportunities beside the challenges for the space agencies to understand how they can manage this enthusiasm besides the uh, managing the astronauts health and well-being Ah, uh, now we kind of moved from the science fiction to science fact. We have our um, uh, experimental environment rather than uh, uh, utopian uh, trans transformative place. Uh, and uh, now this is the time for fortifying our medical and technological science on Earth to fortify the um, uh, space exploration. The goal of the, the optimum goal of the space exploration is a space, a deep space mission with the goal of um, um, answering this question, how we can generate an artificial ecosystem for the long-term support of human life in a space. How we can establish meaningful civilization beyond our own planet, whether we can, we can select Mars or the moon as our home. So with these questions, with this um, 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 desired future that the space agencies are seeking for uh, answering the, uh, the uh, enthusiasm of the human being for uh, space exploration, uh, we have um, uh, 258 individuals from two countries uh, that uh, have visited the International Space Station thus far. And as of today, as I am talking to you, uh, to you, we have 11 astronauts are in space now, and this is a, uh, um, actually, a uh, considerable amount of uh, uh, people in, uh, in a space that we have to think about their health and their well-being while the health, health hazards are uh, going to be some of the biggest challenges for these astronauts, for instance, losing up to 25% of their muscle mass, adding two inches of height, losing one and one and a half percent of bone mass, risk of high blood pressure, puffy faces, risk of fat accumulation, lose of eye vision, high risk of fractures, and also exposure more than more cosmic radiations are the uh, health hazards that they are experiencing. And the digital technology, medical science have to uh, respond to these situations for creating better um, uh, situation for the astronauts or even for the space traveler in near future, if we, if we want to expand our uh, health tourism uh, and commercial trips in our space uh, agencies. These digital technologies hold the potential to bridge the gap between the space and Earth ecosystem to create a fruitful interaction between space travelers and medical teams. And these uh, technologies enable preventive diagnosis and uh, post-cure during the astronauts space uh, at international space stations and allows uh, for seamless continuity of care before, during, and after their mission. So what we learn in these uh, sessions, we can uh, we have different types of digital technologies to uh, assist the uh, space travelers uh, during their uh, space ex exploration. For instance, uh, the current technologies that we have is text, phone, email. Uh, as a mobile health services, we have we can have a chatbot because chatbots are new, new technologies, so we can use the chatbots uh, to provide the astronauts twenty four seven access for self care services, uh, which is part of the AI-powered uh, medicine. The video conferences is another way that they are using in their communication with the care team on 
on the earth, on the earth uh, wearable sensors to collect vital signs and biometrics of the astronauts are going to be uh, the uh, one of the big projects that not nasa is um, 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 seeking we have uh, robots for minor surgeries ultrasound and also these robots can uh, help the um, um, uh, astronauts to do the minor surgeries cpr or do the ultrasound uh, on the space stations the digital twin can be another option uh, to use this uh, uh, real, to use the real world data to create simulation and predict how a product or process or even a body of the astronauts will perform on the space. This is another great uh, future for the um, uh, NASA projects and uh, the AI powered uh, medicine. Decision support systems are the solutions to, uh, to uh, be an alternative and support uh, for the astronauts during the um, uh, technological barriers, during the uh, missing the telecommunication uh, the services. So, uh, or even in uh, during the uh, uh, crisis management, so we can use this kind of technologies to uh, be responsible uh, for uh, all the events. What is the goal? The goal of all these AI, AI powered medicine, um, digital twin, chatbots, and all the uh, digital technologies that we are developing on Earth is about the personalized medicine. What, what we are going to do is that to create personalized medicine for astronauts uh, based on their individual factors, physical factors, and environmental factors. So by gathering the information about their age, race, gender, physical status, mental status, immune system, genetics, pharmacodynamic, and also the mission duration, we can create a comprehensive, seamless information about that specific uh, astronauts and personal, uh, provide the personalized medicine for uh, uh, for them in an individual level. So I just put the uh, picture of Sally Christine Wright uh, in this presentation because like yesterday was uh, her birthday and it was the memory of the first American woman and the third woman in the space. Uh, so I just uh, use her photo here on the memory of her. So. Uh, the uh, uh, telemedicine projects, we have telemedicine projects in space and telemedicine projects on the Earth. And both of these uh, uh, telemedical projects are helping together to cover and uh, the fortifying the uh, social and humanitarian benefits for all humans around the globe. The result of using the technologies in the space can be generalized to the expansion of telemedicine in a rural area and on the other hand the studies of remote uh, locations around the world can provide us this opportunity to create uh, the uh, impact direct of development of the space station clinical programs for uh, space agencies uh, with this uh, explanation, as you can see here in this slide, we have many types of contribution of space technologies in the medical field that impact on um, progress and advancement of the uh, digital technologies on Earth. For instance, uh, uh, development of the MRI and CT scan by creating digital image processing uh, to enhance pictures on the moon and planet uh, was one of the helpful projects by NASA that uh, brought off the uh, advancement in our image processing for MRI and CT scan on the Earth. Uh, the outcome of using telemedicine in rural areas were helpful to development of ultrasound program in a space for the uh, NASA projects. The digital twin, uh, was born by NASA in the 15th, uh, and now it can be used in clinical process improvement, tracking, and ad advancing modeling of human body. 
Another project that is under test is about the Astro skin, uh, which is a wearable jacket and headband uh, with biomedical sensors developed by, uh, by one of the um, Canadian uh, agent, uh, uh, companies. So this uh, wearable sensor can uh, collect the biometrics from the astronauts and transfer their information uh, to the uh, care team on Earth. This is another example. Uh, one of the great examples that I have here for you about the experiments in space uh, with using the um, challenges that they have, the astronauts have in the space. For instance, the ex extreme bone loss uh, uh, in space uh, create a unique opportunity to develop a cure for uh, osteoporosis. Also, uh, uh, microgravity allows unique conditions for the growth of protein crystal in a space. And this um, uh, knowledge uh, uh, helps the treatment of uh, doshe muscular uh, uh, dystrophy in Earth. This is another uh, great example. And also we have uh, the... Uh, uh, a robotic uh, system in a space stations uh, that can be used uh, for uh, breast cancer and uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, robot works inside an MRI machine to help accuracy of the uh, uh, location of the uh, tumor and the size of the tumor. So that, as you can see here, we have many types of um, contribution between the space uh, exploration projects and the uh, medical uh, field. Uh, and this kind of uh, uh, mutual uh, projects can brought off the uh, new uh, knowledge and the new uh, the transformation in our uh, digital health services. So uh, while we have two uh, subject matters here, I would like to say this opportunity to say that while we are uh, expanding our, our freedom of digital health knowledge in the universe, let's think about the rocket, satellites, and spaceships that are pollinating space. So um, as you, you know that uh, the, the debris in the space can be a huge th uh, threat for the uh, space and all, uh, uh, extra uh, travelers and also for our Earth. So how we can uh, create a strategic uh, initiatives and solutions to respond to this situation as well. And as we are expanding our reading on telemedicine on space, let's think about the uh, uh, establishing digital services and telemedicine services for all around the globe, in the sky, on the land, on the ocean, and under the water. Uh, so uh, the, it was a, a brief uh, a wrap up for this session. So uh, we would be happy to answer any questions. If the audience have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, open your microphone or uh, share your question on uh, chat uh, box. So we will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much for having me in this uh, presentation. Simon. Thank you, Professor Dina, for bringing so much relevant information about this this fascinating theme in digital health, in the field of digital health and telemedicine. And uh, I learned a lot with all these distinguished speakers. It's a very, it's a pleasure to be here learning with you all. So. Um, if you, uh, can you pass out the exam now? Just kidding. <laughs> Uh, oh, if you allow me, I would like to, to start with uh, a question uh, before going to the audience. Well, I was very curious to know about um, uh, how is, if there is a, a protocol for, uh, like a, to evaluate the, the clinical condition of the astronaut before going to a space mission, and uh, how, how is that uh, mm -hmm. before? 
So for uh, so for yeah. for astronauts that are flying to the space station, they they there's a selection process. They go through a uh, you know they have to do medical examinations and psychological examinations and. They have to write, you know, they have to apply. I mean, it's physical application and they have to write a statement and so forth. Uh, and then they go through extensive training. And so the astronauts to fly on the ISS or on NASA sponsored missions go through extreme training and extreme medical evaluation. Those Russian cosmonauts or European or Canadian or Japanese or other nationalities also follow the same guidelines. They're in med volume A, B, and C. Uh, and those requirements are for anyone who's going to fly to the space station. Those individuals that are then approved by the Space Medicine Board, multilateral Space Medicine Board, and then they fly. <clears throat> Astronauts who fly, or, or space flight participants who fly on SpaceX and they go to the space station must also follow the same guidelines. Those who are gonna fly uh, into space and not dock with the space station, follow the FAA class classification physical examinations. And so to fly into space is flying above the Kármán line, uh, which is uh, into where the, the uh, I can't remember, it's like, I don't know, 80,000 feet or something like 65,000 feet, but once you approach that, now you're in space. So if you're in a rocket ship, that goes up and comes down, the training for that may be mere weeks. And we, we see a lot of like Captain Kirk as an example, William Shatner went up, uh, the examinations he went through and the training went, he went through was nothing like an astronaut or a cosmonaut would go through. So there are very detailed processes, protocols for training and for uh, selecting out. So the astronauts that are selected, they select out or you hope they select out things that might cause uh, medical problems in the future or psychological problems in the future. That's a very interesting field in medicine. Thank you for your answer, Professor. And uh, now we have a question for Amon Jamil. Thank you, Jamil, for your question. And um, is there any positive effects of the space environment on the human body? That's the question, please. You're muted, Ty. If I get a pound for every time that I do that, I will be a millionaire by now, pay my trip into it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, I was just mentioning that um, one area of my studies you now that is, um, it was based, the base of my PhD was uh, pulmonary functioning during microgravity simulation with hypoxia light exercise. And um, it is quite interesting that the lungs are very well adapted to microgravity. In fact, they improve their function in microgravity. And um, uh, because uh, very briefly, you know, I, I don't want to, to stress too much the, the, the physiology behind it, but basically um, our, our, let's say, distribution of uh, the blood in our lungs and the ventilation in our lungs is, uh, is, is gravity dependent here on earth. So it doesn't matter if you are in a standing or, or supine position lying down, or if you are upside down, you are gonna always have an area of your lung that is less perfused, less blood, and less ventilated, less air coming in and out. Uh, in space, it is it improves because there is no. It's it's not perfect as expected. It was expected to be completely homogeneous distribution of uh, perfusion and ventilation, blood and, and air. No, but it is um, it is not. But it is very 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 close to perfection, <laughs> and because there is no other uh, damage, let's say to the, the the lung function. So lungs improve their function in space. So it's not uh, all bad news. Uh, this, uh, the, the, the environment of space can, um, can uh, bring some um, good aspects uh, to our health and uh, well-being, especially for the lungs. So I always say in my lecture that if you are just a lung you know, with a helmet and maybe a pair of boots <laughs> would be surviving space very well. Unfortunately, we have the brain, we have the heart, and we have everything else. 
So it's not that easy. But for well, the lungs, that, it is. Yeah, I was going to say, I think you're right. I mean, the, the lungs, obviously, but I think the body adapts. When you're in space, you're, you, you will adapt. Uh, and as long as you do the prescribed countermeasures, and I'll use an example on one of the MIR missions, uh, the, uh, I, I always forget their last names, but the two o Olegs came back with Shannon um, and she was able to walk off the shuttle because she did her countermeasures. She ran on a treadmill, she fluid loaded, but the, uh, Ole, the two Olegs, the two cosmonauts did not, and they had to be carried off. So if, because we've developed now over the last 50, 60 years, an understanding of countermeasures, that this is the exercise, running on a treadmill, resistive exercise devices and so forth, we're able, and fluid loading, we're able to mimic what the exercise would be on the ground so that it keeps the body in good condition. Now you're gonna lose muscle mass and bone mass, but not, it's not gonna be so deleterious that you can't walk when you get to Mars. Now, if you do none of that, uh, countermeasure stuff. You don't need your arms and your legs. You don't certainly don't need your legs to stand in space. But once you get to the next place, you're going to need your all your systems to work together, right? So so you you do adapt. But when you come back to Earth, you're doing the post flight adaptation. So when an astronaut or cosmonaut comes back, it's not a good idea for them to stand in a hot shower on the first day without somebody there to help them. Uh, but they can be back driving a car uh, and doing life's normal work within a couple of weeks. We have many interesting questions, but we are running out of time. For instance, uh, we had questions about uh, pregnancy uh, in the space and delivery in a space. We have uh, some questions about the uh, portable hospital in a space. Uh, well, I think with the hospital, <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 interesting I, questions. In yeah. Yeah. I think with regard to a hospital, there, there are medical kits on the space station and there's a link back to earth and that space, those space, it's called health maintenance system. It's pretty robust. Um, on a, a Mars mission or on a gateway mission that's going to be uh, launching here in the next couple of years with Artemis 1, there, there will be uh, medical capabilities on, uh, on another planet. It won't be a full scale ER, but remember the astronauts and cosmonauts and whoever's flying are chosen from the best of the best. They're going to be the best, and I'll use... Um, I, I don't know if Beckham is the best soccer player in the world, but let's use Beckham or LeBron James is the best basketball player. They're gonna be the best of the best. And so their health is already uh, in, such, in such good condition, they're not gonna be the average person. So many of us uh, can, can fly in space, go up and come down, but to stay up there a long time, it's not a good idea. So, so the first requirement is really, really good health. It's highly selective. Number two, there will be a mini, uh, cap mini capability, it won't be a hospital, but they'll be able to address medical needs. Now, keep in mind, if I go back 15 years from today, not literally uh, the 27th of May, but I go back 15 years, no one knew what an iPhone was, 2007. And 15 years from now, in 2030, whatever, 2038, the technology that we're going to be using doesn't even exist. So I'm not so concerned about the capability of medical care, the smart medical systems we need but NASA and its contractors are working toward that regard. With regard to pregnancy in space, um, I, I think that someday that's gonna happen. Uh, but the question I've always asked, and I'm not sure I know I understand enough of this kind of physiology, but does meiosis and mitosis work effectively? Can a cell split apart and replicate without, with the absence of gravity? Yeah, but we need to remember that we we are formerly microgravity. You know? We are in the womb in a liquid. So we are floating all the time. We are reproducing the cells in microgravity. Uh, so point. it's a good point. Yeah, I, I just realized that one day suddenly. I feel that there is this major, this huge taboo about uh, sex in space and, and procreation in space or reproduction in space. 
But when you talk about live, living in space or going to the moon and uh, you know, live there, work there, this has to be somehow uh, studied, you know, as we do here on Earth. So very scientifically, uh, I think that we should try to approach this. Uh, there, there are some studies with small animals like frogs and mice in space, uh, which um, you know, uh, is a first step, let's say, but you need to be doing that maybe with big, uh, uh, bigger animals, mammals, uh, that we can uh, more correlate better with men, uh, with uh, you know, men and women. Uh, but I think that it, it, this taboo has to be lifted. <laughs> well, you know, along that lines, it's also the selection of the crew, right? So if you're going to go to Mars on a, on a national mission, not, not SpaceX where Elon Musk sends, you know, 100 people on the big, huge rocket, but if you just have a crew of, uh, is it a crew of five or a crew of six? Is it a crew of seven or a crew of eight? The reason why I say it is if it's odd, it's three against two. So three people vote yes, two people vote no. Then the question is, is the, the composition of the crew all men, all women, or a mixture of men and women? Are, 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 they, are you gonna send couples, married couples? Because if you're in a, and just imagine that each of us in a small room, I mean, in my office, which is, you know, I don't know, 100 square feet, 150 square feet or so. If you're in a space station, and I always use, um, take, uh, take three uh, Airbus fuselage without the wings, and they're connected. And you're inside that for three years, right? Or two years or whatever it is. And you're in this situation with, with one another, there is the opportunity that relationships will develop. So right now, uh, the astronauts are given the opportunity to either manage their cycles themselves or, the, or NASA can help with medication and so forth, but it's a personal choice. But at some point in the next several decades, someone is gonna get pregnant in space and someone's going to deliver a baby in space. And it may be on the surface of Mars. If it's in a space station close to earth, uh, then that probably will, they'll probably come back to earth. But we don't know because we haven't done that yet, right? So, I, I think that too, uh, one of the main concerns in my opinion is that we, we are, uh, is more the fecundation itself because it's, it's the movement of the, the, the spermatozoids and the, where they are gonna meet the egg. Because um, as we know, there is no, uh, let's say uh, anatomic connection between the ovary and the fallopian uh, tube. Right. And maybe this will be, mm, it moves a bit of course in microgravity by displacement of the organs. And maybe this, uh, for me, fecundation and, and, um, and the implantation of uh, in the, in the, in the um, uh, uterus is, is something more challenging, I believe, uh, you know, than maybe the pregnancy itself. For the pregnancy, uh, as we said, as we realize it is more like to be microgravity as we are here on Earth when we are, our mothers were pregnant of us. But um, I think that the, 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 maybe the key point there is the radiation if it could damage the, 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 the cell development in a way that it creates some uh, issues for the fetus, uh, for the baby. Yeah. Uh, okay, perfect. Thank, Thank you. you so much, really. I appreciate it. So we have another question, but we don't have time to answer the, all uh -huh. these uh, amazing questions. I, I, just uh, as a brief announcement, I will be uh, working with, uh, with the team to uh, uh, provide a webinar about the metaverse and telemedicine digital health just uh, stay connected with us in linkedin and social media so we will update you about this uh, upcoming web webinar as well Simon. you can certainly send questions i mean if you have questions you can send to them of email. course sure oh good good because we Thank have you. a lot of interesting <laughs> questions here but we have unfortunately exceed our time and uh, it's a very very uh, interesting topic so we are very honored to have you all here thank you very much Thanks. thank you see you so, all there thank you for all the audience thank Thanks you for so inviting much. me and uh, nice to see you again charles Hope yeah you, yeah you as well to see you again yeah. sure yeah thank you bye 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 bye, bye. 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 thank you bye.